I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. One thing that nobody knows is a little secret about this show is that when I started out, I always feel like, hey, I should tell a little bit about myself. Uh, The few listeners that I have, maybe they want to know something about me. What makes a man that sits around in his free time uh, reading other people's books out loud, uh, what makes that man tick? Let's get inside this man. Well, that's gross. I, uh... Don't have anything to say. Before I hit record, I sit here with my eyes rolled up at the ceiling, trying to think of, like, what happened this week? Do I got anything pithy to say? I got nothing pithy to say. Uh, My kids are gone for the weekend. Back at their mom's. And, uh, And I'm reading from an actual book made of paper, instead of the Kindle, where I get to make the font size really huge. If you ever want to learn how you can read a book uh, for the first time out loud and sound like a professional, the only trick is, and it's the only trick, is just make the font size really huge. Now that I'm reading from a paper book, uh, I can't choose my font size, and so I'm actually worried about how I'm going to come off on this one. Uh, That's something that ran through my head. Uh, Other thing that ran through my head... I'm not getting tired of my basement window. Ever since I got the basement window put in, I just... Every time I put any laundry in the the washing machine, I close the door, I turn it on, and then I look up, entranced, locked in to this tiny window. A window the size of a... like two fists. Two fists long and one fist high. It's just the tiniest thing, and I just stare out it. It's kind of like a weird, sort of sad moment some sort of existential crisis I'm having where I look out this window. Uh, I remember uh, True Detective the first season. Uh, What was the guy's name? Clay? I forget what his name was. Phil? Uh, The weird nihilistic one. Uh, uh, he, He would stare into the smallest piece of glass just to look at only his eyeball. To have his own eyeball stare back at him. Because he was looking for some great answer that would come out of that exercise. Uh, I don't have that. I have a tiny window. And I basically stand there and stare out the tiny window, transfixed, like in a trance. Just looking across the yard, up into the neighbor's top attic bedroom. Just stare. And I'm sure they've stared back. Uh, They say what what you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back. Well, it's my neighbor. My neighbor stares back. Uh, And it snowed today. For about an hour, huge flakes, the size of a baby's fist, each one gently floating down to the ground. So I got that to look forward to, living in Minnesota. Uh, that winter's already trying to start, and I hate it. But that's about it. Uh, Trump's still the president, and he's still alive. So I don't wish death on a man. I'm glad he's still alive. I wish he would have learned something from his illness, but he didn't. He came out saying, uh, ah, if you ever get COVID, just keep a stiff upper lip and you can beat it. You're stronger than a disease, which is such a weird thing to say. Well, with that, let's dive into our story. This week, uh, we're going to read a work from the uh, author Tom Hood, which is a pretty average-sounding name. Uh, It could be anybody. Uh, He was born on the 19th of January, 1835, and died the 20th of November, 1874. He was an English humorist and playwright, uh, and his son, uh, and the son of a poet and author, Thomas Hood. So... His dad's name was Thomas Hood. His name is Tom Hood. I imagine Tom is a nickname, so he's Thomas Hood II. Why didn't they... 
Is he trying to divorce himself from his dad by not putting the second on there? I actually went to high school with a kid who had a second on his name, and he's pretty proud of that. A prolific author. Uh, in 1865, he was appointed editor of the magazine Fun, which sounds like a great time. Good for him. And he founded Tom Hood's Comic Annual in 1867. That's a guy who's trying to break away from his father and uh, became an editor of a, of a magazine called Fun. And he started his own comic annual. So this is a guy who sounds like a good time, and he just wants to live his own life and not have any kind of controversy. Well, there was controversy. He had an Alice in Wonderland controversy. In 1887, the literary critic Edward Salomon uh, uh, suggested that Lewis Carroll had plagiarized Tom Hood, uh, his book From Nowhere to the North Pole, in 1875. Uh, so... It doesn't seem that Tom Hood really replied to it or had much to say about it, but Carol did. Oh, he got indignant. He replied a month later in a terse letter to the editor of the 19th Century. I guess that's the name of the paper. Sir, which is written in all caps, I find it stated in an article of Literature for the Little Ones <laughs> in your October number that my little book, Alice's Adventures of Wonderland, first published in 1865, was probably suggested by the late Mr. T. Hoods from Nowhere to the North Pole, first published in 1864. May I mention, first, that I have never read Mr. Hood's book, secondly, that I have composed mine in the summer of 1862 and wrote it out uh, in my view and no doubt in that many others of your readers and acted dishonesty to imitate another man's book without due acknowledgement I trust in your sense of justice to allow this reply to the charge brought against me in the above name article to appear in your forthcoming number man so books that I read from you know previous previous century they're always incredibly wordy and don't get to their point. And it gets a little frustrating when you're reading for like 40 minutes and you're just, you can see how they're dancing around the point they're going to make before they finally get to it. Even the letters that they write each other, they do the exact same thing. In 1889, Carol even inserted an announcement in the back of the nursery Alice, correcting his previous explanation and further denying Tom Hood's influence. So he's just a bitter little man. He writes, in October 1887, the writer of the article on literature for the little ones, <laughs> which is just the cutest title for a segment of some sort of magazine, in the 19th century, stated that in 1864, Tom Hood, in all caps, was delighting the world with such works as From Nowhere to the North Pole. Between Tom Hood, in all caps, and Mr. Lewis Carroll, in all caps, there is more than a suspicion of resemblance in some particulars. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland nearly escapes challenging a comparison with From Nowhere to the North Pole. The idea of both is so similar that Mr. Carroll can hardly have been surprised if some people believe that he was inspired by, in all caps, Hood. The date, 1864, is a mistake. From Nowhere to the North Pole was first published in 1874. So, what do we learn about our author? Apparently he sat back silent. While uh, it was Carol, it was just a whiny bitch. Let's move on to the story. The Shadow of a Shade by Tom Hood. My hands are so dry from this fall weather, I am not going to be able to turn these pages. This is going to be horrible. To think that I'm crippled from all this time using a Kindle. My sister, Letty, has lived with me ever since I had a home of my own. Uh, she was my little housekeeper before I married. Now she's my wife's constant companion and the, quote, darling auntie of my children who go to her for comfort, advice, and aid in all their little troubles and perplexities. <laughs> but she has a comfortable home and loving hearts around her. She wears a grave melancholy look on her face, which puzzles acquaintances and grieves friends. A disappointment, exclamation point? Yes! Uh, the old story of a lost lover is the reason for Letty's looks. Uh, she has had good offers often, but since uh, she lost the first love of her heart, she has never indulged in the happy dream of loving and being beloved. Uh, 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 George Mason uh, was a cousin of my wife's, uh, a sailor by profession. Uh, he and Letty uh, met one another at a wedding and uh, fell in love at first sight. 
Oh, George's father had been serviced before him on a, on a great mysterious sea and had been especially known as a, a good Arctic sailor, having shared in more than one expedition in search of the North Pole and the Northwest Passage. Turning the page. Burp. It's not a matter of surprise to me, therefore, when George volunteered to go out on the Pioneer, which has uh, being flatted out for a cruise in search of Franklin and his missing expedition. Uh, there was a fascination about such an undertaking uh, that I felt I could not have resisted had I been in his place. Of course, Letty did not like the idea at all, but uh, he silenced her by telling her that men who volunteered for Arctic search were never lost sight of it, and that he should not make as much of an advance in his profession in a dozen years as he would in a year or so of his expedition. Uh, I cannot say that Letty, even after this, was quite satisfied with the notion of his going, but uh, but at all events, uh, she didn't argue against it any longer. Ah, the grave look, which is now habitual with her, uh, yeah, but was a rare thing in her young and happy days, passed over her face sometimes when she thought no one was looking. Uh, my younger brother, Harry, who was at this time an academy student, ah, ha, ha. he was only a beginner then, and now he is pretty well known in the art world, weird, and his pictures command fair prices. Like all beginners in art, he was full of fancies and theories. Oh, he would have been a pre-Raphaelite, only pre-Raphaelism had not been invented then. His per peculiar craze, that was weird that I couldn't get that out of my mouth, was for that he started the Venetian school. Now it chanced that George had a fine Italian-looking head, and Harry persuaded him to sit to him for his portrait. It was a fair likeness, yeah, but a very moderate work of art. The background was so very dark, and George's naval costume was such deep uh, and rich in color that the face came out too white and staring. It was a three-quarter picture, yeah, but only one hand showed in it, leaning on the hilt of a sword. As George said, he looked much more like the uh, commander of a Venetian galley uh, than a modern, uh, modern mate. Wow, I'm having a tough time. I told you, tiny font sizes. However, the picture pleased Letty, who did not care much about art provided by the resemblance was good, so the picture was duly framed in a tremendously heavy frame of Harry's ordering and hung up in the dining room. And now the time for George's departure was growing near. Oh, the pioneer was ready to sail. Ah, ha, ha. And the crew only waited orders. All the officers grew acquainted with each other before sailing, eh, which was an advantage. George took up uh, very warmly with the surgeon, uh, Vincent Grieve, and with my permission brought him to dinner once or twice. It, a poor chap, uh, he has no friends nearer than the Highlands, and his, uh, his precious lonely work. Uh, bring him, by all means, George. You know that any friends of yours are welcome here. So Vincent Grieve came, and I'm bound to say I was not favorably impressed with him. Blah. And almost wished that I had not consented to his coming. Now, he was a very tall, pear, a little, uh, fair young man with a hard scotch face and a cold gray eye. Ooh, a cold gray eye. And there was something in his expression, too, that was unpleasant. Something cruel or crafty, yeah, or, or both. I considered that it was very bad taste for him to pay such marked attention to Letty, coming as he did as the friend of her fiancé. He kept by her constantly and anticipated George and all the little attentions which lovers delights to pay. I, I think I think George is a little put out about it uh, and that he said nothing, attributing his friend's offense to lack of breeding. That's weird. Letty did not like it at all. Oh, she knew uh, that she was not to have George with her much longer and she was anxious to have him to herself as much as possible. But Grieve was her friend's her lover's friend. She bore the inflection of the best possible patience. Now, the surgeon did not seem to perceive in the least that he was uh, interfering where he had no business. So he was quite self-possessed and happy, with one exception. The portrait of George seemed to annoy him. Yeah, he had uttered a little impatient exclamation when he first saw it and drew my attention to him, and I noticed that he tried to avoid looking at it. At last, when dinner came, he was told to sit exactly facing the picture. <laughs> Weird, he hesitated for an instant, and then sat down, but almost immediately rose again. It is uh, very childish, uh, and that sort of thing, he stammered, but I cannot sit opposite that picture. It's not high art, I said, 
and may irritate the critical eye. I know nothing about art, he answered, uh, but it's one of those unpleasant pictures uh, whose eyes follow you about the room. I have an inherited horror of such pictures. Uh, my mother married against her father's will, and when I was born, she was so ill. Uh, she was hardly expected to live, and when she was sufficiently recovered to speak about delirious ramblings, that she implored them to remove a picture of my grandfather that had hung in the room, uh, which she vowed made threatening faces at her. Yeah, it's superstitious, uh, but constitutional. I have a horror of such paintings! Exclamation mark. I believe George thought this uh, was a ruse of his friends, a uh, seat next to Letty. Yeah, but I felt sure it was not, for I had seen the alarmed expression on his face. At night, uh, when George and his friend were leaving, I took an opportunity to ask the former, eh, half in a joke, if he would bring the surgeon to see us again. Yeah, George made a very hearty assertion on the contrary, burp adding that he was pleasant enough company among men at the inn or on board a ship, but not where the ladies were concerned. Mm -hmm. But the mischief was done. Vincent Grieve took advantage of the introduction and did not wait to be invited again. He called the next day, uh, and nearly every day after. He was a more frequent visitor than George now, for George had obliged to attend his duties, and they kept him on board the Pioneer uh, pretty consistently, where, whereas the surgeon, having been the supply of drugs, etc., was pretty well liberty. Letty avoided him as much as possible, but he generally brought or professed to bring some little message from George to her so that he had an excuse for asking to see her. And that's all weird. I can't imagine, eh, like my friend Corey saying, hey, I want you to come over to my friend's house. And then I make an ass out of myself and do something weird and get all creepy on someone's wife or something. And then, and then I start calling that friend all the time because I want to come over uh, by myself. Yeah, just weird. On the occasion of his last visit, uh, the day before the pioneer sailed, Letty came to me in great distress. The young cub had actually had the audacity to tell her that he loved her. Uh, he knew, he said, about her engagement to George, but that did not prevent another man from loving her, too. Mm -hmm -hmm. A man uh, could no more help falling in love than he could uh, help taking a fever. Letty stood upon her dignity and rebuked him severely. But he told her that he could see no harm in telling her of his passion, though he knew it was a hopeless one. Uh, a thousand things may happen, he said at last, uh, to bring your engagement with uh, George Mason to an end. And perhaps you will not forget uh, that another loves you. Oh, I was angry and was forthwith going to give him my opinion on the conduct. When Letty told me that he was gone, uh, that she had bade him go and had forbidden him to the house, uh, she only told me in order to protect herself, uh, for she did not intend to say anything to George, for fear it would lead to a duel or some other violence. Uh, that's the last we saw of uh, Vincent Grieve before the pioneer sailed. George came the same evening and was with us till daybreak, uh, when he had to tear himself away to join his ship. After shaking hands with him at the door and in the cold, gray, drizzly dawn, I turned uh, back into the dining room where poor Letty was sobbing on the sofa. I could not help starting when I looked at George, his portrait which hung above her. The strange light of daybreak could hardly account for the extraordinary pallor of the face. I went close to it and looked hard at it. And I saw that it was covered yeah, with moisture and imagined that it was possibly made it look so pale. Uh, as for the moisture, I suppose poor Letty had been kissing the beloved portrait <laughs> and that the moisture was caused by her tears. Okay, first of all, you got a painting that's, that's, that's wet. <laughs> and then you, you suppose that someone's kissing and crying all over it? That's not normal. You don't just let that slide. It was not uh, till a long time after when I was jestingly telling Harry how his picture had been uh, caressed that I learned the error of my conjecture. Letty assured me most solemnly that I was mistaken in supposing she had kissed it. So he's telling this out loud to people with her there. I think she kissed and cried all over it. <laughs> She's supposed to be cool with that? Yeah, it was the varnish blooming, I expect, said Harry. Oh, trying to turn a page. I think I'm turning two. My hands are so dry. Thus the subject was dismissed, for I said no more. Though I knew well enough, in spite of my not being an artist, that the bloom of varnish was quite another sort of thing. The pioneer sailed. Ah, we received, or rather Letty received, 
two letters from George, which had taken the opportunity of sending by uh, homeward bound whalers. In the second, uh, he said it was hardly likely that he uh, should have an opportunity of sending another burp as they were sailing into high latitudes into the solitary sea, which none but the expedition ships ever penetrated. Ah, oh, they were all in high spirits, he said, for they had encountered uh, very little ice and hoped to find clear water further north than usual. Moreover, he added, Grieve had held a sincere uh, so far, for he had not had a single case of illness on board. He had held a sinkature. Well, I'm not using my, uh, my Kindle, so I can't just push on that and find out what it means. So we're never going to know. Signature or sincere? It says signature. Whatever. Then came a long silence, and a year crept away very slowly for poor Letty. Once we heard the, from the expedition from the papers, they were reported as pushing on and progressing favorably by a wandering tribe of ex-esquimanax, with whom the captain of a Russian vessel fell in. Oh, they laid the ship up for the winter, and they were taking the boats on sledges, and they believed that they had met with traces of the lost crews that seemed to show that they were on the right track. The winter passed again. Ah, Then spring came, and it was a balmy, bright spring, such as we get occasionally, even in this changeable and uncertain climate of ours. One evening, uh, we were sitting in the dining room with the window open, for although we had given up fires, the room was so oppressively warm that we were glad of the breath of the cool uh, evening breeze. Letty was working. Yeah, poor child, though she never murmured. She was evidently pining at George's long absence. Harry was leaning out the window, studying the evening effect on the fruit blossom, which was wonderfully early and plentiful, mm, and the season was mild, ah. And I was sitting at the table near the lamp, reading the paper. Suddenly, there swept into the room a chill. It was not a gust of cold wind, uh, for the curtain by the window did not uh, swerve in the least. But the deathly cold uh, pervaded the room. It came. It was gone in an instant. Letty shuddered as did I, by the intense icy feeling. As she looked up, how curiously cold it's got uh, all in a minute, she said. Uh, We are having a taste of poor George's polar weather, I said with a smile. Uh, In the same moment, I instinctively glanced toward the portrait. Uh, What I saw struck me dumb. A rush of cold blood, a fever heat, uh, dispelled the numbing influence of the chill breath that seemed to freeze me. I have said the lamp was lighted but it was only that I might read with comfort. For the violet twilight was still so full of sunset that the room was not dark, but as I looked at the picture, I saw it had undergone a strange change. I saw it as plainly as possible. It was no delusion coined uh, for the eye by the brain. I saw, in the place of George's head, a grinning skull! Exclamation point. I stared at it hard, semicolon, but it was no trick of fancy, period. I could see the hollow orbits, the gleaming teeth, the fleshless cheekbones. It was a, the head of death, exclamation point. Without saying a word, I rose from my chair and walked straight up to the painting. As I drew nearer, a sort of uh, mist seemed to pass before it, and as I stood close to it, I saw only the face of George. The spectral skull had vanished. It Poor George, I said unconsciously. (laughs) Letty looked up. The tone of my voice alarmed her, and the expression of my face did not reassure her. Uh, uh, What do you mean? Have you heard anything? Oh, Robert, in mercy, tell me. She got up and came over to me, laying her hands on my arm, and looked up to my face imploringly. Uh, No, my dear. Uh, How should I hear? Only I could not help thinking of the privation and discomfort he must have gone through. I am uh, reminded of it by the cold. Cold, said Harry, who had left the window by this time. Cold? What on earth are you talking about? Cold? Such an evening as this? Uh, You must have a a touch of the og. A-G-U-E. Again, I can't look up the pronunciation. I'm not going to stop the show to go look this up. I think it's og. I should think. Uh, both Letty and I uh, felt it bitterly cold a minute or two ago. Uh, did you not feel it? Not a bit. And I was three parts out the window. I ought to have felt it. Is this a person that just, like, walked up from outside and just poked his head through the window and shouted, Cold! Uh, I ought to have felt it, if anyone did. 
I was curious, uh, but the strange chill had been felt only in the room. It was not by the night wind, but by some supernatural breath connected with the dread apparition I had seen. It was, indeed, the chill of polar winter, uh, the icy shadow of the frozen north. Uh, What day of the month, Harry? I asked. Uh, Today, the 23rd, I think, he answered. Then added, taking up the newspaper. Oh, so he's not standing outside, poking his head through the window. Uh, I have been reading. Uh, Yes, here you are. Tuesday, February the 23rd. If the Daily News tells the truth, which I suppose it does, newspapers can't afford to tell the truth about dates. Whatever they may do about art. Harry had been rather roughly handled by the critic of a morning paper for one of his pictures a few days before, and he was uh, a little angry with the journalism generally. Well, we didn't need to know that. Presently, Letty left the room, and I told Harry uh, what I had felt and seen, and told him to take note of the date, for I feared that some mischance had befallen George. No, I put down uh, in my pocketbook, Bob, but you and Letty must have had a touch of the cold shivers. Your stomach or fancy misled you. Uh, the same thing, you know. Uh, besides, as regards to the picture, there's nothing in that, exclamation point. Uh, there's a skull there, of course, as Tennyson says. Oh, here's a little, little poetry. Any face, however full, padded round with flesh and fat, is but modeled on a skull. That's a beautiful poem. The skull's there, just as in every uh, good figure subject. The nude is there out of the costumes. Oh, you fancy that is a mere coat of paint. Uh, But nothing of the kind. Art lives, sir. That is just as much a real head as yours with all the muscles and the bones. Just the same. What makes the difference uh, between the art uh, and rubbish? This is a favorite theory of Harry's, uh, who had not yet uh, developed from the dreamer into the worker, as I did not care to argue with him. I allowed the subject to drop after we had written down the date in our pocketbooks. Letty sent down word presently that she did not feel well and gone to bed. My wife uh, came down presently and asked what had happened. If uh, She had been up with the, uh, with the children and had gone in to see what the matter is with Letty. Uh, I think it is very imprudent. To sit with the, uh, with the window open, dear. I know the evenings are warm, but the night air strikes cold at times. At any rate, uh, Letty seems to have caught a violent cold, if for she's shivering very much. Yeah, I'm afraid she's got the chill yeah, from the open windows. So is this... 23rd... Sorry, I'm totally holding up the show here. February 23rd, and I imagine this is England. Wouldn't it be cold in England? Why have they got their windows open? They're talking about how hot it is. What are they, in Australia? I thought this... Where the, where the hell is this taking place? I think it's pretty to sit by the window open, dear. I know the evenings are warm, but the night air strikes cold at times. Anyway, Letty seems to have caught a violent call, but I just read that. I did... I, again, Kindles. I did not say anything to her, except that both Letty and I felt a sudden coldness, for I did not care I had to enter into an explanation again, for I could see Harry was inclined to laugh at me for being so superstitious. At night, however, in our room, I told my wife uh, what had occurred and uh, what my apprehensions were. Yeah, she was so upset uh, and alarmed that I almost repented having done so. The next morning, Letty was better again. Nah, nah, nah. And as we did not either of us refer to the events of the preceding night, the circumstance appeared to uh, be forgotten by us all. But from that day, I was ever inwardly dreading the arrival of bad news. And at last it came, as I expected. Well, I hope he checked his pocketbook. One morning, just as I was coming downstairs uh, to breakfast, uh, there came a knock at the door, uh, and Harry made his appearance. It was very early to visit for him, for he generally used to spend his mornings at the studio and drop in on his way home at night. Uh, he's looking pale and agitated. Uh, Letty's not down, is she? Uh, yet, he asked, and then, uh, before I could answer, add another question. Uh, what, what newspaper do you take? Uh, the Daily News... I answered, uh, why? She's not down? Uh, no. Uh, thank God. 
Uh, look here. He took the paper from his pocket, gave it to me, pointing out a short paragraph at the bottom of the columns. I knew what was coming the moment he spoke about Letty. The paragraph was headed. Fatal accident to one of the officers of the Pioneer Expedition ship. It stated that news had been received at the Admiralty, stating that the expedition had failed to find the missing crews, but had come upon some traces of them. Burp, want of stores and necessities, had compelled them to turn back without uh, following those traces up. But the commander was anxious, as soon as the ship could be refitted, to go out and take up the trail where it left it. An unfortunate accident had depraved him of one of the most promising officers, Lieutenant Mason who was uh, precipitated from an iceberg while out shooting with the surgeon. He was uh, beloved by all, and his death had flung a gloom over the gallant little troop of explorers. Uh, It's uh, it's not in the news today, Uh, thank goodness, Bob, said Harry, who had been searching the paper while I was was reading the one he brought. Uh, But you must keep sure and look out uh, for some days and not let uh, Letty... See it when it appears, as it is certain to do sooner or later. Then we both took a look at each other with uh, tears in our eyes. Uh, Poor George! Uh, Poor Letty! Exclamation points on both of those. We sighed softly. Uh, But she must be told at some time or another, I said despairingly. I suppose so, said Harry. But it would kill her uh, to come on something like this. Uh, Where's your wife? She was with the children, but I sent her up and told her the ill tidings. She had a hard struggle to conceal her emotion for Letty's sake, but the tears would flow in spite of her efforts. How shall I ever find courage to tell her, she asked. Hush, said Harry, suddenly grasping her arm and looking toward the door. I turned. Ah, there stood Letty, ah, with, the, with the pale face as death, with her, with her lips parted and her blind look about her eyes. She had come in without our hearing her. Uh, we never learned how much of the story she had overheard, but it was enough to tell the worst. Oh, we all sprang toward her. Well, that's weird. You see her at the door, and it's like, ah, and you go rushing at her. Uh, but she only waved us away uh, and turned around and went upstairs again without saying a word. My wife hastened up after her and found her on her knees by the bed, insensible. Well, the doctor was sent for, and restoratives were promptly administered. Well, what's a restorative? Did they just, like, start feeding drugs into her? She came to herself again. What? But lay dangerously ill for weeks from the shock, probably from all the drugs you gave her. It was about a month after she was well enough to come downstairs again that I saw the paper, an announcement of the arrival of the Pioneer. The news... Had no interest for any of us now, so I said nothing about it, but the mere mention of the vessel's name would have caused the poor girl pain. One afternoon, shortly after this, as I was writing a letter, there came a loud knock at the door. I looked up for my... It's going to be that guy. Uh, I writing and listened, for the voice which inquired as if I was sounded strange, but not yet altogether familiar. As I looked up, puzzling, though it could be, my eyes rested accidentally upon poor George's portrait. Was I... Dreaming or awake. Okay, I'm going to call it now. The creepy guy is going to come back and try to make moves on her, and he's going to get aggressive towards her, and the ghost of George is going to come back and uh, protect her. I'm calling it. I'm, this is where it's going. I'm pretty sure. Here we go. All right, so I told you uh, that the one hand was resting on a sword. I could see now distinctly that the forefinger was raised, as if in a warning. Oh, I looked at it hard to assure myself it was no fancy, that I perceived, standing out bright and distinct on the pale face, at two large drops, as if of blood. Oh, I walked up to it, expecting the appearance to vanish, as the, uh, the skull yeah, had done, but it did not vanish. But the uplifted figure itself uh, resolved into a little white moth, which had settled on the canvas. Well, that explains that. The red drops were fluid, which certainly not blood, though I was at a loss for the time to account for them. Uh, the moth seemed to be in a torpid state, so I took it off the picture and placed it under uh, an inverted wine glass on the mantelpiece. Well, that's weird. So you <laughs> put it in jail, I guess? All this took less time to do than to describe. As I turned for the mantelpiece, uh, the servant brought in a card, saying that the gentleman was waiting in the hall to know if I would see him. Well, well, well. 
On the card was the name Vincent Grieve of the Exploring Vessel Pioneer. Oh, thank heaven Letty is out, I thought I. And then added aloud to the sir, eh, show him in here, and Jane, if your mistress, and uh, Miss Letty come in before the gentleman goes, uh, tell them I have someone with me on business and do not want to be disturbed. Burp. I went to the door to meet Grieve, as he crossed the threshold, and before uh, he could be seen the portrait, he stopped, and he shuddered. And he turned white, even to his thin lips. Now cover that picture before I come in, he said hurriedly in a low voice. Uh, you remember the effect that has upon me? Now, with the memory of poor Mason, it would be much worse than ever. Well, I could understand his feelings better now than at first, for I had come to look upon the picture with some awe myself. Well, yeah, the skull and everything. So I took the cloth off the little round table and then stood under the window and hung it. Over the portrait. Why would you? This guy has already been creepy. Don't show him that much respect. When I had done so, Grieve came in, and he was greatly uh, altered. He was thinner and paler than before. He hollowed-eyed and hollowed-cheeked. He had acquired a, a, a strange stoop, too, and his eyes were uh, had lost the crafty look uh, for the look of terror. Uh, that is, a, a, of a haunted beast. I noticed that he kept glancing sideways every instant, as if consciously, and, uh, and it looked as he heard someone was behind him. I had never liked the man, but now I felt an, an insurmountable repugnance to him. A so great a repugnance that, when I came to think of it, I felt pleased that the incident of covering the picture at his request had led to my not shaking hands with him. Or just not cover the picture and tell him, like, you're not, you're not supposed to come here. Get out of my house. I felt that I could not speak otherwise than coldly to him. Indeed, I had to speak with painful plainness, probably because he murdered the guy, George. I told him that, of course, I was glad to see him back, but I could not ask him to continue to visit us. I should be glad to hear the particulars of poor George's death, but that I could not uh, let him see my sister, and hinted, as delicately as I could, uh, at the impropriety of which he had been guilty when he last visited. Oh, he looked at all very quietly, uh, only grieving a long, weary sigh. When I told him I must beg him not to repeat his visit, he looked so weak and ill that I was obliged to ask him to take a, a glass of wine, an offer which he seemed to accept with great pleasure. I got out the sherry and the biscuits and placed them on the table between us. He took a glass and drank it greedily. It was not without some difficulty that I could get him to tell me of George's death. Oh, he related with evident reluctance about how he had gone out to shoot a white bear, which they had seen an iceberg, strain along the shore. And the top of the berg was ridged with a, like a roof of a house. And sloping down on the side of the edge of a tremendous overhanging precipice, they had scrambled along the ridge, uh, in order to get nearer the game, when George incautiously ventured on the sloping side, uh, I called out to him, said Grieve, and, uh, and I begged him to come back, ah, but too late. Ah, the surface was smooth and slippery as glass. I tried to turn back, but he slipped and fell, and then when he, he then began the horrible scene. Oh, slowly, slowly, but with ever-increasing motion, he began to slide down toward the edge. Oh, there's nothing to grasp at. Uh, no regularity or uh, projection on the smooth face of the ice. Oh, I tore off my coat, and I hastily attached it to the stock of my gun and pushed the ladder toward him, uh, but he did not reach far enough, and before I could lengthen it by trying my cravat, uh, do it uh, yet further away, and, and more quickly I shot in agony. Ah, oh, there was no one within here. He, too, saw his fate was sealed, and he could only uh, tell me to bring his last farewell to you. Oh, and to her. Here. Grieve's voice broke. Then it was all over. Then he clung to the edge of the press piece instinctively for one second and was gone. I love that as he's sliding down the sheer face of ice, he's like, tell them that I love them. <laughs> that was pretty weird. Just as Grieve uttered the last word, his jaw fell. His eyeballs seemed ready to start from his head. He sprang to his feet, pointed at something behind me, and then flinging up his arms, he fell with a scream as if he'd been shot. Ah, but he was seized with an epileptic fit. <clears throat> Instinctively, I looked behind me as I hurried to raise him from the floor. The cloth had fallen from the picture. There, 
The face of George, made paler than ever by the gouts of red, looked sternly down. Oh, I rang the bell. Luckily, Harry had come in, and when the servant told him about the matter, he came in and assisted me in restoring grief to consciousness. Of course, I covered the painting up again. When as he found himself again, grief told me he was subject to fits occasionally. Nah. He seemed very anxious to learn if he had said or done anything extraordinary while he was in his fit, and appeared reassured when I said he had not, because he's a murderer. He apologized for the trouble he had given, and said as soon as he was strong enough, he would take his leave. He was leaning on the mantelpiece as he said this, a little white moth caught his eye. Because for no reason, the moth in the painting, you could just shoot it out the window. Nah, you're going to keep it in a glass. For how long? I don't know, till it dies. What's the point? But it served its purpose now because he saw the moth on the mantelpiece. So have you uh, had someone else from the Pioneer come here before me? He said nervously. And I answered in the negative, asking what made him think so. Oh, why, this, uh, this little white moth is never found in such southern latitudes. It is one of the last signs of life northward. Where, where, where did you get it? I, I caught it here. Uh, in this room, I answered. Uh, that is very strange. I never heard of such a thing before. Uh, we shall hear of showers of blood soon. What? I should not wonder. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, what do you mean? I asked. Oh, this little fellow's amid little drops of red, uh, looking fluid at certain seasons, and sometimes uh, so plentifully that the superstitious think that the shower of blood I have seen is uh, snow quite stained in places. Take care of it, as it is a rarity in the South. I am, after this story, I'm going to have to look this moth up, if it really exists, because that seems weird. A white moth that just showers blood all over everything. I noticed after he left, eh, which he did eh, almost immediately, there was a drop of red fluid on the marble under the wine glass. The blood stain on the picture was accounted for. Uh, but how come the moth's here? And there was another strange thing about the man, which I had scarcely been able to assure myself from out of the room. Uh, there was a, 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 a there were cross lights uh, up but about which was no possible mistake where I saw him walking uh, away up the street. Harry, here, quick, I called to my brother, who at once came to the window. Uh, you're an artist. Uh, tell me, is there anything strange about that man? Why do you got to be an artist to also be a psychologist? No, nothing that I could see, said Harry. But then suddenly, in an altered tone, added, yes. There is, by Jove, he has a double shadow. That was the explanation of his sidelong glances. On the habitual stoop, there was something always at his side, uh, which none could see, but which cast a shadow. Turning the page, just one, my fingers are so dry. He turned presently and saw us at the window. Instantly, he crossed the road to the shady side of the street. I told Harry uh, all that had passed, and we agreed that it would be well not to say a word to Letty. Two days later, when I returned uh, from a visit to Harry's studio, I found the whole house in confusion. I learned that Letty, uh, from Letty, that while my wife was upstairs, Grieve had called, creepy little bastard, uh, had not waited for the servant to announce him, but had walked straight to the dining room uh, where Letty was sitting, and he noticed that she avoided uh, looking at the picture and had to uh, make sure of not seeing it. He had seated himself on the sofa just beneath it. Uh, he had then, in spite of Letty's angry reminiscences, uh, renewed his offer of love, strengthening it, finally by asserting to her that poor George, with his dying breath, had implored him to seek her and to watch over her and to marry her. Yeah, that's kind of questionable. His, his sliding down the ice, he's been saying a lot about his uh, wishes before his death. I was so indignant, I hardly knew how to answer him, said Letty, when suddenly, just as he uttered the last words, there came a twang, like a breaking of a guitar. And I hardly knew how to describe it, but the portrait had fallen, and the corner of the heavy frame had struck him on the head, cutting it open uh, and rendering him insensible. Oh, they carried him upstairs by the direction of the doctor, for whom my wife had once sent on hearing, and had occurred. Uh, he was laid on the couch in my dressing room, where I went to see him. 
Oh, I intended to reproach him for coming to the house, despite my prohibition, but I found him, eh, eh, delirious. The doctor said it was a queer case, for though the blow was a severe one, it was hardly enough to account for the symptoms of brain fever, which he had learned that Grieve had but just returned in the pioneer from the north. He said it was possible that the privation and hardship had told of his constitution and sown the seeds of his malady. We sent for the nurse. I was sent up with him by the doctor's directions. Uh, the rest of the story is soon told. In the middle of the uh, night, I was roused by a sudden uh, scream. I slipped on my clothes and rushed out to find the nurse with Letty in, in her arms in a faint. I would carry her to the room, and the nurse explained the mystery to us. And yet, it, it appears about midnight, grief sat up in bed and began to talk, and he said such terrible things that the nurse became alarmed. Uh, nor was she much reassured when she became aware that the light of her single candle flung what seemed to be two shadows of the stick man on the wall. Terrified beyond measure, she crept into Letty's room. That's weird. And confided her fears to her. That's very weird. And Letty, who was courageous and a kindly girl, dressed herself and said that she would sit with her. She, too, saw the double shadow, but what she heard was far more terrible. Grieve was sitting up in bed, gazing at the unseen figure to which the shadow belonged, uh, in a voice that trembled with emotion, I begged the haunting spirit uh, to leave him and to pray for forgiveness. Uh, you know, the crime was not premeditated, and it was a sudden temptation, the devil that made me strike the blow and fling you over the precipice. It was the devil tempting me with the recollection of, uh, of her exquisite face of the tender love that might have been mine. But for you. But she will not listen to me. See, she turns away from me, as if she knew I was your murderer. George Mason, he says the full name at the end of it, so you have no confusion about who he murdered. It was Liddy who repeated in a horrified whisper this awful uh, confession. I can see it all now. As I was about to tell Letty of the many strange things I had concealed from her, the, the nurse who had gone to see her patient came running back in alarm. Vincent Grieve had disappeared. Uh, he had risen in his delirious terror. He had opened the window and uh, leapt out. Two days later, his body was found in the river. Oh, well, there you go. A curtain hung now for before poor George's portrait, although it is no longer connected to any supernatural marvels. And never since the night of Vincent Greaves' death have we seen aught of that most mysterious haunting presence, the shadow of a shade. Well, what did we learn here today? Well, first of all, we learned that I can call it. Uh, the ghost didn't specifically come. Well, no, the ghost did come back and kill him. So I was right about that. Uh, I'm right about that. I've read enough of these stories from this time period where I'm just good at it now. We also learned that characters from stories of this time don't have any forethought. Nobody thinks two steps ahead, much less five or ten. Uh, if you take the time to kill a man... Um, Come up with a better and more consistent death story. Don't just say, as he was sliding down the ice, he said I should come talk to you. Or, uh, you know, to the dad. Or, uh, as he's sliding down the ice, he's also saying, make sure that you take care of my fiance, who I love so much, as he falls. No, no, that's true. You got to be more consistent. And also, when you kill a man, are you going to feel good about going after his woman? Especially when you're feeling haunted by two shadows? If you got two shadows following you around everywhere... You're probably going to think, eh, I'll stay away from his fiance or whatever, his girlfriend or whatever she was at the time. But, nope, uh, that's not really the way these things are written. But I will say this story was better written and more concise than uh, stuff I've been reading recently. So good for uh, whoever this author is. I forgot his name already. But good for him. Uh, not a lot of roundabout talk. It takes 20 minutes to get to your point. He just got to his point and it was well written. So good for him. Good story. How does it tie in with what I said earlier? Uh, it doesn't. After I finish this, I'm just going to hit save. 
and then I'm going to hit publish. I'm going to walk away and go back to that window and just stare out of it for hours and just sit there, sipping in my kombucha, just waiting for something. What's going to happen? I don't know. Hey, maybe there's a story here. My house is haunted. I'm waiting for something supernatural. What's going to happen? And then all of a sudden, a woman's going to come out and go, ah, marry me. And then I'll say, oh, I'm divorced. I'll marry anybody. And then that'll be the end of the story. Well, with that, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I am planning on plowing through a ton of uh, ghost stories for this month. Oh, I've already scheduled it on my calendar. Each night I'm recording something, and each night that I don't have my kids, I'll be publishing something. So, if you like Halloween, and you like scary stories, uh, boy am I the guy for you. So, uh, have fun dealing with all that crap. And thanks for being a listener. I definitely appreciate it. I've got, like, five people, and I appreciate every single one of you. So, uh, thanks for listening, and I will see you on the next episode.